Okay, well, today is going to be a um, review day. And what I'd like to do is go over some of these worksheets. Now, I didn't create these. These were created from with a friend of mine up in uh, Tacoma. But they're, they're pretty uh, reasonable worksheets. And they're also, I have the answers to them as well. So I want to go over these with you guys today. And there's another um, couple worksheets that are available as well with answers. So lots of practice, lots of practice. Also, um, you may have two three by five cards for a unit two, because the structures are pretty complex and um, um, you can have whatever you want on, on uh, three by five, both sides. So, okay, um, let's see, let's go down. Okay, right here. Also uh, available is the, um, flow chart for unit two and um, this is the part that's the trickiest part down in here. Okay, so let's go ahead and start here. Okay, like all tests, there's going to be, um, <laughs> sorry, there's going to be uh, naming and, and uh, structures from names, and there will be reactions um, and uh, uh, what else is left? Intermolecular forces. Okay, so let's look at some of these now. Name the following. Okay, well, to start with, this is a ketone that would be the backbone, and we have a methyl group as a branch. So it's a one, two, three, four, five. So it's a pentam. Exactly, pentamone. And we have a branch. Uh, and it's at carbon number two. Uh, and we have one, two, three, four. So it's four methyl two pentanone. Okay, we've got a aldehyde in this case. One, two, three, four. So it's going to be a but Butanal. And one, two, two, four. Dime Bromo. Butanal. And notice I didn't put one butanel because the only place the aldehyde can be is a carbon number one. Okay. Um, here we have a five-sided cyclic ketone with a couple of chloro branches. So it's going to be Cyclopentanone, and we have one, two, three, four, five. So two fives. Cychloro, cyclopentanone. Here we have a ketone 
um, one, two, three, four. With a methyl branch and a phenyl branch. So we can number this um, from the left. That'll give us the lowest number for the backbone naming the functional groups. So that's going to be Corman number two there, then. And we have a three methyl, one phenyl, two butanol. So, any questions about the um, naming of these structures? Okay, so let's go ahead and go on. Um, okay, so we've got a ketone here and an aldehyde. So I've officially run out of room. <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll put number five right up here. No, that's a big one. Let's do the, um, both these are big. Let's do this one up here at the top. Okay, so it's a cyclohexanone six membered ring. And we have three methyl. So this is always number one, one, two, three methyl. Okay. Um, this guy here is an aldehyde, so that's a ketone. This is an aldehyde. So we've got butanol, four carbons long. And so butanol, so we put the aldehyde on the end. Okay, and at carbon number Three is a bromo, so one, two, three. And four is a phenol. Okay, draw structure formulas and provide the IUPAC names for the aldehydes and ketones that have the molecular form of C3H6O. Well, let's just start with <clears throat> the simplest form. Okay, we have six hydrogens. Well, we do an aldehyde. So here's an H here. Here's three H's. So that's four total, and then Six H is there. So that's one. And then the other one would be the ketone version. And to name these, let's name this one here. Um, okay, it's a three three carbon ketone, so it's going to be a Propanone. And do I have to put two propanone in there?
Not really. No, because it can only be a two. Because being a ketone, it's got to be in the middle somewhere. And there's only one spot that's the middle. So I would suggest to be consistent with the two men. Just so that you don't have to worry about, oh, is this, is this one of those optional ones or whatever? Just put it into the two. That way you don't have to worry about, you know, the exceptions and stuff. But theoretically, um, I mean, this is acetone. So you don't have to uh, put the two in because there's only one place it can be. So either answer would be fine. Um, and then um, that's it for that. And this is going to be... Um, Propanol, and same with this one. One propanol, by default, it's one automatically. Okay, so um, show hydrogen bonding between the molecules below. Okay, well, water has got a remember those are symbols for partial. Uh, for those of you in a STEM, oh, you're not in a STEM track, you're in an allied health track. If you're taking um, differential equations, that little squiggly line is, is called a, um, instead of a full-fledged G, it's a, it's a Greek D. Anyway, that's, don't write that down. <laughs> okay, and then this guy here is going to be um, partially negative, partially positive. So the the hydrogens are going to like the um, um, carbonyl group. And then this oxygen here is going to like the carbon at the bottom of the carbonyl group. And on the test, I would say, if this was the, the question on a test, I would say, um, rewrite for convenience. In other words, you can move the water around so that it's closer to wherever you need it to be. But that's what I'm looking for, is knowing that water is very polar and uh, it uh, and the carbonyl group on both the ketone and the aldehone, al aldehone, aldehyde are um, also polar, not as polar as the water because there's no hydrogen bonding there. But there is hydrogen bonding going on with the water, water. Uh, bonding with that. So this would be soluble. How soluble? Um, it would vary a lot from partial to full-blown solubility, depending on, on the size of this group here. If this gets very big, then it becomes insoluble. If it stays small, it's it's soluble then. Okay, so how do we make this guy? Well, it's an acid, okay? Um, so how are we gonna make this guy? Well, if we have a We oxidize a primary alcohol. We're going to get a um, aldehyde, and then we continue the oxidation. We're going to get an acid. So, and then our backbone is going to be this guy here. Okay, so that's the primary alcohol. I'm going to oxidize that to the aldehyde.
And then from there, we're going to oxidize the aldehyde to the acid. Now, I wouldn't ask you to name these guys. Um, this is kind of a tricky name. Uh, I mean, it's not all that tricky, but it's tricky enough to be out of the scope of this class. Um, I would just ask you for the structures. Because here you've got a, um, a phenol branch off of this. one carbon alcohol and then the, the phenol has got a branch off of it. So if I had this as a question on a test, uh, I think my friend was overzealous when he did this because um, he and I used to teach the same class and we trade worksheets. <laughs> okay, does that make sense though um, over here? Primary alcohol oxidized to aldehyde oxidized to the acid. That's the primary flow chart. Okay, more reactions. Okay, so this is a reduction. So when we add hydrogens, we're reducing. When we take hydrogens away, we're oxidizing. So we have a ketone. When our ketone is reduced, it goes to a secondary alcohol. Now, this is kind of a pain to name also, because you've got a one carbon. <laughs> one carbon alcohol with two cyclohexane branches. So I would not ask you to name this guy if this was on a test. The purpose of me requiring you to name structures is so you focus on the structures. But if the name is so goofy, it, it defeats the purpose of that. Um, Okay, so let's look at down here. Okay, we what do we have here now? We have an alcohol, a three carbon alcohol, and a one, two, three, carbon hemi something. Okay, so we've got O, C, O. So we have an anomeric carbon there. So if we do the um, is there an H there? No. That means it's a Eat of something, and there is a O oh, there. So this is a hemi ketal. Okay, so we add a alcohol to a hemi ketal. That's going to add to create a ketal. So this is going to be a ketal over here. Okay, so here's our backbone. And this is our secondary backbone along with 
the secondary backbone. Now this this was created um, this hemi um, ketal over here was created from a different alcohol than what we're adding. So you don't have, you don't have to add the same alcohol each time. You can add different alcohols for the second step. In other words, when we go to a hemi ketal to a ketal, you're just adding an alcohol. It could be the same alcohol, it could be a different alcohol. In this case, in fact, I'm, I think I'm going to change this. Um, let's change this to... Um, So it's the same alcohol now. Um, okay, so we've got a, key, a hemi ketal over here. And when we add an alcohol to a hemi ketal, it goes to a full-blown ketal. Okay, and so the um, alcohol binds to the anomeric carbon right there. So we get the original backbone, one, two, three, four. And here's the original alcohol offshoot. And then this new one adds up here. So this is going to be the keto. This is the hemi. Tell this is the alcohol. So now we have original backbone, primary backbone, secondary backbone. Any questions about that one? Now, naming these guys, I don't want you to name these, but the way you name them has to do with um, an oxy, and then it'd be a branch. So this would be one, two, three, four. So it would be butane, two, propoxy, excuse me, two, two, dipropoxy, butane. And the oxy groups are oxygen plus uh, an aliphatic chain. Okay, but we're not naming um, any of the ketals or acetals. Okay, so is everyone okay with that reaction? So the difficulty level in this test coming up is I'm not gonna give you different alcohols adding. It's gonna be the same alcohol. And I would probably start with um, the original ketone, uh, the butanol ketone. And then I'd keep adding the uh, propyl alcohols to it. Okay, uh, all right, let's go on. Um, all right, so we have an aldehyde, recarbon aldehyde, and we're adding two alcohols. So the first time we're going to add it, now this is a um, open L, and this would be new propanol. So what's going to happen is this is the anomeric carbon. What's going to happen is this alcohol now is going to add once to the anomeric carbon and create the hemiacetyl and add again to produce the full-blown acetyl. 
So let's do it in two steps. Let's do it with, first with the hemiacetyl. Okay, so our original structure, our primary backbone is going to be this. And we have a So the carbonyl is converted to, in the first step, to an alcohol. And that alcohol is going to add to the an anomeric carbon right here. Let's do it in uh, So we have our three carbon backbone. And we have our secondary backbone. So aldehyde to hemiacetyl. I'm going to continue on and add another propanol to the anomeric carbon. And that keeps going. So that would be our full blown cell. And then this here, since we start with two, let's just make this a one. And then we need another. Alcohol here is going to attach here. I wish he had left more space. Okay, this is exactly the same reaction. We have an aldehyde plus alcohol. It's gonna the alcohol is gonna attack the uh, aldehyde twice, giving us a uh, full blown acetyl. So it's gonna go to the hemi, and from there it's gonna go to the full acetyl. Okay, so what we're going to do is this. Okay, I'm going to. This is going to be a really short one. This is a this is a ketone, and ketones don't oxidize. So this is an NR. So we have room down here to do this reaction. Um, and we have to name this though. It's a cyclo. Pentanone. So ketones can't be oxidized. Okay, so let's do this reaction up here. So if we do a line drawing of methanol, it looks like this. So we're going to take this guy. Oh, 
primary backbone. Secondary backbone. This is our going to be our anomeric carbon. It's the hemiacetal primary, secondary backbone. So all this centers around the anomeric carbon every single time. That's where the action is. And now when we get into the carbohydrate version of all this, the same thing, the anomeric carbon. And that's always displayed in the Hawthorne projection to the right. Okay. So we can form acetals and ketones, but we can also hydrate them. Okay, so in other words, we're gonna take them apart. So first thing to do when you're doing that is to identify the primary and secondary backbones. Okay, so this is the primary backbone. Notice there are no H's inside here. That means it's gonna be a ketal So when a ketal goes through hydrolysis, what happens is you lose the, um, in this case, it's methoxy group. And then continuing on, you lose the other one. So um, Oops. Now we're at the hemi ketel. We continue to add water. What's going to happen? It's going to now lose the this other methoxy group. So it's a one carbon alcohol. So when you do the backbones. And the anomeric carbon, once it loses that um, methoxy group, is going to revert back to the ketone. So this is, we're kicking off this alcohol here. And then here we're kicking off an alcohol too.
Okay, so we go ketel, hemiketel, ketone. Okay, this is a multi-step. Oh, we need to do one more here. Okay, this is a what? OCO. We have an H there. And we have no OH. So this is a acetal. Okay, so let's look at the primary backbone, which is going to be this here. Three carbons. So we need to have a one carbon. Epoxy group. So the first step is to create a hemiacetal. So now we'll go on and do the acetal. <clears throat> okay, so first thing we're going to do is going to kick off one of the methoxy groups in the first reaction here. So it's going to look like this. And this is going to be the anomeric carbon. We form the hemiacetal, and now we have the three carbon backbone aldehyde from which we started. And when we're hyd hydrolyzing a acetal or ketal, each time we kick off alcohols. Okay, so this is getting into some, um, as far as this class is concerned, this is going to be the more complex reactions you're going to run into. And the reason why I'm allowing you to have two three by five cars is because it's um, the structures in this unit are, are tend to be big and clumsy. Okay. Um, all right, so is write equations to show how the following convergence can be performed. Multiple steps may be required. Okay, well, first of all, We have an OCO. Okay. OCOs are, uh, in this case, it is a ketal because there's no H there in the anomeric carbon and there's no OH, so it's full blown ketal. When we add a alcohol, to a ketone, we get a, in two steps, we get a ketal. Okay, we're starting though with an alcohol. So is there a way to get the alcohol to a ketone? Yes. So the first step is to oxidize the alcohol. That generates our ketone. Now, the ketone, so we go, this would be um, cyclopentanol to cyclopentanone. Now, Primary backbone, secondary backbones when the alcohol is added. So those are one carbon alcohols we're going to be adding. 
So if we add So there's our primary ketone from which we're starting. We're going to add first we're going to add one methanol. That'll form the hemi. Oops, So there's our hemi ketel. I'm going to add to that another one carbon alcohol. which is going to be added to the um, anomeric carbon. So again, this would be an extra credit problem. Now, this next problem is multi-step as well, and it's kind of the opposite. We start with a ketone. And what can you do with a ketone? There's only one thing you can do with a ketone. You can reduce it. So if you look at here's the ketone. And the reaction for the ketone is here. So we hydrogenate it, okay? And that produces a secondary alcohol. Okay, it's the only thing we can do with a ketone. It's a pretty stable, stable contact compound. So what we're gonna do is um, gonna name this that's so going to be um, cyclo six sided exonone. Okay, so the first step in uh, reducing is we're going to reduce it, which requires hydrogen gas and platinum electrode. We're going to end up with the alcohol, secondary alcohol. And then what we can do is
And that step is right over here. We have an alcohol. And if it's So that'll give us um, the alkene. In an acidic environment. Okay, so we name these. This would be cyclohexanol. This would be cyclohexene. Okay, so that took us an hour, almost an hour to get through. And that's with me doing it. So this is, would be really good practice for you. And we haven't touched on biochemistry yet. This is just strictly organic stuff. Okay, and I have all the answers here. Oops. And what happened to the biochemistry? Do we get the reaction chart for the for this test like last time or no? Yeah. Hey, I always give you the, the, the flow chart. So you you can have I'll give you the flow chart and then you'll uh, have your two uh, three by five cards. Okay, so here is the biochemistry part. Okay, so these are typical biochem questions. Uh, name the sugar. Tell me the linkage, whether it's reducing sugar or not, and a test to determine whether it's reducing sugar or not. So, um, oh, I also wanted to cover, before I do that, um, there is a um, relatively new uh, sugar substitute on the market. And who has heard of allulose? Okay, it, it's up and coming and it's got some really good potential. And it's if we look at fructose, Okay, so that's fructose. It's not well drawn. Let me redraw. It's kind of stupid looking. Okay, and this, this is going to be beta fructose. Okay, um, let me show you allulose now. Let's do a beta allulose as well.
What's the difference between the two? Um, one of the OHs is uh, up versus down. Yeah, exactly. Hardly any difference. It's on carbon one, two, three. So for fructose, the hydroxyl group goes up carbon three. With allulose, it goes down. That's it. So the receptor in your mouth is looking for fructose as one of the many sugars. Okay, allulose fits in there quite nicely. It's a, it's a, um, these are both keto exoses. In other words, this guy here is a hemi ketal, not a hemi acetal. Um, they're both keto hex uh, hexoses, so it fits into the receptor site, your sweet receptor site, pretty well. But to metabolize carbohydrate like fructose, it's got to go through first glycolysis. Third step of gly glycolysis is where you either can, either fructose comes in or the uh, glucose you start with is converted to fructose, either way. But the third step anyway is basically a fructose uh, deviant. Okay, well, this doesn't work. This will not be accepted by the, by the enzyme that does that conversion of fructose. So what happens is it's, it's similar enough that it stimulates your sweet receptors in your mouth, but it's, it's different enough so that it's not metabolized. There's another um, substitute. Um, and it's based on glucose. And what happens is So what happens is what they do is they substitute the hydroxyl group with a chlorine. That's called sucralose. That's been around for a while. Um, so both these are designed to imitate the real thing, but they're different enough so they're not metabolized. So there's zero calories, basically. And you, get, you don't get any of the side effects of fructose. So it's, anyway, it's a fairly new um, a sugar substitute. And you can get it as beta and alpha, or probably it's probably mixed when you get it. Um, and they're looking at it very closely. Uh, so they thought sucralose was the big deal and it turned out to have some side effects, but it's um, still reasonable. You know, as far as, uh, I don't like sugar substitutes. I'd rather eat just less sugar than put a sugar, sugar substitute in. Because for me, I don't know why it has an aftertaste. Now, I've never tried allulose, though. I need to try it and see if there's an aftertaste. And everyone's taste buds are slightly different. Okay, and you do not have to remember allulose for the test. I just wanted to bring it up and show you this is the kind of the new thing. And you've had enough biochemistry now and carbohydrates, so you can you know, recognize that's a, that is a... Um, Six carbon, six carbon sugar monosaccharide, and it's a. Uh, it doesn't have an aldehyde when it opens it up. It opens up to a ketone, so it's called a keto hexose. Okay, so, and it looks a lot like ribose. Ribose doesn't have a carbon. This is a five carbon, so this will be a pentose. So the anomeric carbon is here. So that's a 
hemiacetal, that means it's a reducing sugar. Okay, let's look at lactose. Lactose has got galactose. Glucose, beta one four glycosylic linkage. And the reason why it's beta is because this O here, this oxygen is going up, and there is a hemiacetal. So this is a full blown acetal. This, these would be typical questions I would ask you about. I'd give you a molecule with like a disaccharide and ask you these questions. What's the linkage? What its name? What are the what are the sugars that make it up the di disaccharide? What's the name of the disaccharide, which is lactose? Uh, and is it a reducing sugar? So reducing sugars, you remember, need an hemiacetal present. So we, we have a hemiacetal right over here. There's the anomeric carbons. We have an OCO, OH is present, and there's no, uh, excuse me, and there's an H here as well, so it's a hemiacetal. Hence, it's a reducing sugar. Okay, this, this disaccharide here is sucrose, drawn in the vertical position. Okay, so here's the anomeric carbons. Now the hydroxyl group on this fructose below is going up. So that means that is a beta. The oxygen going down here is an alpha version. This is carbon number two here. This is carbon one. Carbon two. So I'm looking at an alpha one, beta two glycosylic linkage. Now, the OCOs on both the uh, glucose and the fructose are not hemi. They're full blown acetals or ketals. Hence, there's no hemi acetal present. So it's a non reducing sugar. Fructose. Fructose is a um, uh, hexose, but it's a ketose because this opens up to a ketone. Now, it is a reducing sugar because a ketone can interconvert to an aldehyde. It's one of the exceptions. So just remember. And the reason is the ketone, okay, so this opens to a ketone, and the ketone can enter, can interconvert to the aldehyde. And so because it goes to the aldehyde, it can be um, uh, oxidized. Because remember, ketones can't be oxidized. And so if it opens up to a ketone, the ketone part can't be oxidized. But if it interconverts to an aldehyde, it can be oxidized. Because aldehydes can be oxidized. So that's the only exception in this, in this rule is remember fructose. OK. Um, Here is a disaccharide, two glucoses. Let's open, make this bigger. Two 
two glucoses um, with an alpha-4 linkage. That means this is maltose. So because the oxygen group is going down, it's an alpha. So it's an alpha-1,4. This is the fourth carbon, first carbon. Uh, and this would be glucose, and glucose. And what would be the test to see if it was a reducing sugar? Let's look at maltose. So you need to know this reaction. So here's the first glucose. Okay, and let's do um, beta maltose. That means this is going to go up. Okay, so. Right away, we know this is a hemiacetal. That means it's reducing sugar. This is an acetal. So here are the anomeric carbons. There's an H here. That's why it's an acetal, not a ketal. And there's no OH present. Okay, so this is going to open up now. And what's going to open up is the hemiacetal part, not the other part. So from here over, doesn't change. Only the right side opens up. So this side opens up on the right because the hemiacetal was, was going to open up. Okay. So this side stays the same. Just ignore that. The only part that's doing the reaction is this little part over here. So you need to worry about it. But you have to redraw all this each time. So it's kind of a pain. So let's draw the one on the left first. Is this going to stay the same? And when this opens up, this becomes an OH. So this is where the anomeric carbon is now. Okay, so that's the open version of maltose. And it doesn't matter whether you started with beta or alpha, it opens up to that, that aldehyde there. Okay, so let's do the um, then an excess for this to see if it's a reducing sugar or not. Okay, so we're going to add to this in a basic environment, copper plus two. So what happens is the copper wants to go to become copper one and the aldehyde wants to become the acid salt. And the reason why it's an acid salt is because we're in an alkaline environment. So we need to redraw all this junk here to the left.
So this is, becomes the acid salts. And then the That becomes this. There's that. So the aldehyde here is being oxidized. The copper two goes to copper one. In other words, the oxidation state of copper becomes is reduced, hence reduction. And the copper plus one is in the form of this orange, muddy looking stuff. Um, it looks like that. I'm going to call it muddy orange. Because sometimes it's nice orange, other times it's kind of a brownish orange, depending on how strong the um, um, sugar is. Okay, so you need to know that test. You know be able to do a reaction on that. Okay, and then if this was Tollens test, this would simply be whoops, that's a G silver plus one and it goes to silver metal. The only difference. Everything else exactly the same. And in lab, we usually use the Benedict's test because it's cheaper, and the silver stuff is expensive. Okay. All right. So that's basically it for this test coming up next week. Um, these are just more simple reactions. Okay, so how do you guys feel about this? This will be your hardest test, by the way. And it's only hard because of the structures. That's why I'm allowing you two three by five cards. Any questions on this stuff? Okay. That's what I wanted to cover today, a nice review of what's coming up next week. Yes, it is hump day, hot hump day, I might add. Tammy, you said I have in my nutrition studies um, all this carbohydrate stuff. The alanus, the new sugar. We we briefly went over it in our lecture studies. It was still brand new. Oh. Like just coming out. They were all excited about it thinking that it would be great for diabetics and, and uh, yeah, so. And what did your teacher say about it? She was excited about it as well. <clears throat> they still needed to do a lot of testing. I think it was, it was in spring of 2021 when I first heard about it. Yeah, it's not very old. It hasn't been out that long. I mean, it's always been around. They just never, because it's, um, not readily available. I don't know how they're going to, uh, I mean, you can buy it right now um, and try it. Uh, I've been thinking about getting a source and trying it. Um, but it, um... so anyway, yes, Nick, the test is next week. Um, Anita, you can either have a Two three by five cards, front and back. 
for your note sheet. Thank and you, then, Professor. And, then that'll be, that'll, and I'll also give you the flow chart. Thank you. Which note sheet are you referring to, Professor? Uh, the flow chart. Gotcha. Thank you. you. You know what I'm talking about, right? With the flow chart? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sure do. The reaction flow chart. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I guess I'll see the Wednesday folks today in lab. Um, I'll be there. Um, I'd like to start as early as possible because it's a long lab. Um, so when you get in lab, I want you to uh, form, uh, merge your groups of two to groups of four, and we'll, we'll see how it lays out. And we could have a slightly bigger group or slightly smaller group than that. Um, and then uh, go ahead and get started. Um, what I want you to do is take a picture of the glassware setup. You'll see it when you first come in. Take a picture of that because you're going to have to assemble that from your kit. And it's always nice to have a picture you can be looking at. But I'll try to be there at uh, 2.30 because the previous lab um, theoretically could go to 2.45, but they frequently get out early. So if we get out, if we can start earlier, we get out earlier. But it doesn't matter how long it takes. I'll be there. <laughs> OK, any other questions? OK. And by the way, unit two is my favorite unit, just because carbohydrates are such a talked about topic in the dietetic world. It's it's really kind of cool. Uh, I just, all the other units are, are nice units, but two is my favorite, so. Okay, all right, you guys, take care. We'll see you in a little while. And for those uh, Monday folks, um, have a good weekend. Stay out of the, stay out of the heat. Will do. Thank you, Professor. Have a good weekend. Good luck. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. <laughs>